Everybody, good chodesh, chodesh tov, and um, it's interesting that the uh, second day of Sivan, which is uh, tonight and tomorrow, uh, is kind of an odd position because, on one hand, we had Rosh Chodesh Sivan today, and then from the third, fourth, and fifth of Sivan are the three days of preparation where the Jewish people separated uh, in anticipation of Matan Torah, they, uh, man and women, uh, wife separated. So uh, the second day of Sivan, in particular, doesn't have any, any distinction. It's not Rosh Chodesh and it's not Shlosh Shemei Hagbala. So it actually is given a name, it's called Yom Miyuchas, which means the day of distinction, even though it's specifically the day without distinction. Uh, but the reason, so, so maybe it's a Lashon Sagi Nohar, like we say a blind person is called a person with good sight, or the Kiddush of Shabbos morning, which is very short, is called Kiddusha Rabbah, the great Kiddush. So th this day is called Yom Miyuchas, even though there's no Yichas. But in point of fact, other Meforshim point out that it's called Yom Miyuchas because if you follow the chronology of Matan Torah, this was the day when Hashem said, we shall be a Mamleches Kohanim, a kingdom of priests, the Goy Kadosh, and a holy nation. This was the day that we got our mission statements. That was the day before the Shlosh Shemei Hakbala. So as a result, the yichos that a Jew has, the lineage that a Jew has, that special quality a Jew has, was conferred on this day, tonight and tomorrow, called Yom Miyuchas, to be Mamleches Kohanim V'Goy Kadosh. But be it as it may, the holiday of Shavuos, that Amir Sashem we will be celebrating, uh, Motzei Shabbos and Sunday, uh, is described as Zaman Matan Torah, so first of all, let me make uh, one preliminary point. If you look in the Chumash itself, the Torah itself, the Torah nowhere says that this is why we celebrate the holiday of Shavuos. Shavuos in the Torah is described exclusively as an agricultural festival. It's the part of the Torah Shabal Peh that the Torah was given on Shavuos. But here is the question of the Magen Avram. The Magen Avram asks a very, very famous and difficult question. And that is, first of all, we know Shavuos is not based on a calendar date. It happens to be that Shavuos is always on the 6th of Sivan, but that's not inevitable. Unlike Pesach, which is the 15th of Nisan, and unlike Sukkot, which is the 15th of Tishrei, and unlike Yom Kippur, that's the 10th of Tishrei, and unlike Rosh Hashanah, which is the 1st of Tishrei, Sukkot, I'm sorry, uh, Shavuos is defined as the 50th day after your seven week count of the Omer that you commenced on the second day of Pesach. Indeed, that's why it's called Shavuot. It is the holiday based on the counting of weeks. It happens to be based on the present configuration of the Jewish calendar that that will always turn out to be the sixth of Sivan. But that's not inevitable. At a time before we had a predetermined calendar, any given month could either be 29 days or 30 days. Now if you think about it, uh, between uh, Pesach and Shavuos, you have the month of Nisan the, and the end of the month of Eeyore. Now if Nisan and Eeyore are both 29 days, if they are short months, then indeed the 50th day will be later in Sivan and Shavuos will be the 7th of Sivan. If Nisan and Eeyore are both 30 day months, then the 50th day will be earlier in the month of Sivan, and Shavuos will be the 5th of Sivan. It is only if one is 30 and one is 29 that you will get Shavuos on the 6th of Sivan. Now, based on our present calendar, Nisan is always a 30-day month, and Eeyore is always a 29-day month. That is why... Shavuos happens to be the 6th of Sivan. But that is not its definition. Its definition is the 50th day of Svira. And that is the day that we call Zaman Matan Teresenu, the day that the Torah was given. So here's the question of the Magen of Ram. The Magen of Ram says, we can prove from the Gemara and Masechah Shabbos that the Ten Commandments were not given to Am Yisrael on the 50th day of Svira. They were given on the 51st day. And the proof is that Gemara in Masechah Shabbos quotes a brisa 
from Seder Olam. Seder Olam is the rabbinic chronology of the events in Tanakh. And it mentions the, the year the Jewish people left Mitzrayim. The day of the week they left was a Thursday. And the Torah was given on Shabbos, seven weeks later. Now let's figure this out. If they left Mitzrayim on a Thursday, that means that year, the 15th of Nisan, the first day of Pesach, was Thursday. That means the second day of Pesach, which is the counting of the Omer, began on Friday, Thursday night, Friday. Seven weeks take you to Thursday. Right, if day one is Friday, day 49 will be Thursday. Friday will be day 50. But the Torah wasn't given on day 50, which is Friday. The Torah was given on Shabbos, according to Seder Olam. If that's the case, the Torah was given on the 51st day of, from the beginning of Sviras Omer. So we are celebrating Shavuos, or the Torah itself says, to celebrate Shavuos on the wrong day. Now, don't tell your children this. They may get uh, shell-shocked. Uh, you, you ask your five-year-old, what happened on Shavuos, on the 6th of Sivan? So your five-year-old will tell you with bright eyes and enthusiasm, Hashem gave the Ten Commandments and the Aseris Hadibrot on the day of Shavuos. And then you say, wrong, nothing happens. <laughs> on that day, the Torah was given the day after. Well, I mean, I, 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 I apologize for using this analogy. The only thing I can think of, a gazillion havdalos, is when a parent tells their child there's no Santa Claus, uh, as it were, you know. It's kind of a very cruel thing. Again, lahavdil, meya, meya, and alpayim, and uh, millions of havdalos. Right? So, but the question is a very good question. Why do we celebrate Matan Torah the day before the Torah was given? Now, at least in Chutzlaris, they actually get it right. The second day of Shavuos is the actual day of Matan Torah, 7th of Sivan, 51st day of Svira. But the day that we celebrate as Matan Torah in Eretz Yisrael, which after all is the Chag as the Torah configures it, right? The Torah defines Shavuot as day 50. That, that cannot be denied. That is in the Chumash, you count 49 days. And on the 50th day you have a holiday, but that was not the day of Matan Torah. This is the Kasha of the Muggen of Ram. So the Muggen of Ram's answer is the following. In reality, it was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's original plan to give the Torah a day early on day 50. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu told the Jewish people on Wednesday to separate from their wives Wednesday and Thursday, two days of separation, and Hashem will come on the third day to give us the Torah. Now if you recall, Moshe Rabbeinu deviated from God's command. Hashem said, sanctify yourselves today, that was Wednesday, and tomorrow, Thursday, and I will come on the third day, which was Friday, would be Friday. Moshe Rabbeinu changed that commandment. Moshe Rabbeinu told the Jewish people, sanctify yourselves for three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and God will come after the three days. And the Gemara says, again, I'll, I'll try to explain this later, but let me just mention what the Gemara says, that there were three instances of Moshe Rabbeinu adding to God's command on his own volition, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu agreed with him after the fact. The first, was Hashem said two days of separation and Moshe added a third day thereby pushing off Matan Torah by a day. The second was when Moshe Rabbeinu broke the Luchos. That'll be 40 days later when he comes down and he sees the Egel HaZahav. So Moshe Rabbeinu shattered the Luchos because the Jewish people were not deserving. Hashem didn't tell him to do that. But after he did it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, you did the right decision. And the third was Moshe Rabbeinu's decision that from Matan Torah onwards, he remained celibate. He was no longer with his wife. Now, that's not an example that we are to emulate. Indeed, we're not allowed to emulate it. It's a mitzvah to get married, have a family life. But because Moshe Rabbeinu had to be on call 
to HaKadosh Baruch Hu 24-7, Moshe Rabbeinu unilaterally made a decision uh, to be poached from his wife. If you remember, this was actually the Lashon Hora and the criticism that Miriam and Aaron spoke about, that who gives Moshe Rabbeinu the right to do these things. And the Kodesh Baruch Hu basically said, Moshe Rabbeinu is not living by the same rules that everybody else lives on. It's a different type of relationship. So these are three things that the Gemara says, again, we'll, we'll try to explain what that means even, that Moshe Rabbeinu Mosef Yom Ech, uh, Mosef Midato, he added on his own. One was an extra day of preparation for Matan Torah. The second was the breaking of the Luchos. The third was being celibate, separating from his wife. But for our purposes, the most important one of those three is the first one. He added a day to the preparations of Matan Torah. So says the Magen Avram, since had Hashem's original plan been carried out, the Torah would have been given on Friday, which is day 50. We don't celebrate the day that the Torah was actually given. We celebrate the day that the Torah would have been given based on HaKadosh Baruch Hu's original plan. So it's still the case, therefore, that the Aserah Sedibros were not given on the 6th of Sivan, day 50. They were given on the 7th of Sivan, day 51. But the Yom Zaman Matan Torah is based on the hypothetical day that the Rebbeinu Shalalem would have given the Torah had Moshe Rabbeinu not changed the calculus. So this is the Muggin of Ram, right? This is the answer that is given by the Muggin of Ram. So the question that I want to explore is this. Why should the hypothetical day be more significant than an actual day? Me'eza tam whatever the reason, Moshe Rabbeinu changed it. The Torah was not given on Shavuos. The Torah was given the day after Shavuos. If that is the case, then that should have, just like a GPS recalibrates, that should have been a recalibration of the Chag. And the Chag should be day 51. Uh, it's not a, an adequate answer to simply say, well, day 50 was the day Hashem wanted to give the Torah. That's fine, but that was not the day that he gave the Torah. And if it was not the day that he gave the Torah, why should that be the Chag of Zaman Matan Torah Seinu? Right, so that's the question I, I want to explore. So let me start off with a very well-known Gemara, and I'm sure, I, 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 number one, I've mentioned it before, but number two, I, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, many of you, most of you, have, have learned this Gemara before. It's one of the f most famous and actually deepest Agadatas in the Babylonian Talmud. And this is the great story of Tanur Shalachnoi. Tanur Shalachnoi means the oven, uh, the snake-like oven. Now, essentially what this is, imagine you have a portable earthenware oven. And the way the oven was transported was it was cut into horizontal strips like hula hoops. If you're older, you remember what a hula hoop was. Uh, so imagine this cup would be cut into these strips, into these rings, and that's why it's called snake-like, because snakes sometimes put their tails uh, in their mouths, they're like a coil, a coiled snake, and you would transport the oven by carrying these rings over your arm, and when it was time to assemble the oven, you would set it up and you would put mud in between the rings and when the mud would dry, you would have an oven that you could bake in and when it was time to disassemble the oven, you simply got rid of the mud and then you transported the, the rings. So the, there was a machlokis tanoim. Is such an oven susceptible to become tummy? Because what's, if it comes in contact with a dead body or a dead animal, does it become ritually impure? Now the reason there's a shaila is that we know, the Torah does tell us, that ovens are considered to be utensils, and as utensils, they are susceptible to tuma. On the other hand, there's a counter principle that if something is broken, if you take a utensil and smash it, it is no longer makabal tuma. So the question would be whether the portable nature of this oven, is it treated like a broken oven? I mean, in other words, it's not assembled, it's just a bunch of rings. Is that treated like a broken oven? Or no, it's not broken. Uh, it is simply being transported 
from place to place. Machlokis Tanam. The actual content of the Machlokis is not going to be so important for our purposes, but at least you should be aware of what the dispute is. And on this Shiloh of Taner Shalachnoi, Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus, really one of the greatest rabbis of his generation, uh, paskind, it is tohor, it is not susceptible to tumah because it is treated like a broken oven. But all of the other chachamim, all of the other sages, said it is tamay. Right, machlokas. Rabbi Eliezer refused to agree to the chachamim and he brought many, many proofs and many, many arguments and the chachamim refuted them, did not accept the arguments. So Rabbi Eliezer, when Rabbi Eliezer saw he was not winning on the merits, he began to call upon HaKadosh Baruch Hu to do a bunch of miracles to validate the truth of his position. And the Gemara records he called on God to do three miracles. Miracle one, Rabbi Eliezer said, if the halacha is like me, let the tree, carob tree, charuv, uproot itself and fly away. And amazingly, the tree uprooted itself, flew away. The Chachamim were not impressed. They said, we do not listen to trees. And then he said, if the halacha is like me, let the river reverse its course. It's flowing in one direction, let it flow in the other direction. And the river reversed its course, and the Chachamim said, we do not listen to rivers. And then he said, if the halacha is like me, let the walls of this Beit HaMidrash collapse inward. And the walls began to move inward. And Rabbi Yehoshua, who was with the other side, said to the walls, don't you dare move in honor of the Chachamim. So the walls didn't know what to do. They didn't know should they keep bending like Rabbi Eliezer or should they stop bending in accordance with Rabbi Yehoshua. So because of this, the walls remained in a slanted position. And the Gemara says, Ad hayom to this very day, uh, that base medrash, it's probably not around today, but that base measures the walls were slanting like the leaning tower of Pisa. So once again, as you'd expect, the Chachamim said, we don't listen to walls. So we don't listen to trees, and we don't listen to water, and we do not listen to walls. Finally, Rabbi Eliezer pulls out the big guns, which is really implicit in what he did all along, and he said, if the halach is like me, let there be a voice from Shamayim that declares that I am correct. This is called a basko. This is a heavenly voice. And the heavenly voice announced from Shemayim the halacha is like Rabbi Eliezer. Hashem. And the Chachamim said to that voice, we don't listen to you either because you, Hashem, said in your own Torah, lo ba Shemayim he. The Torah is not in heaven. You gave us the authority to determine what the din is and therefore stay out of it. <laughs> now this seems like a remarkably uh, chutzpah type of, uh, actually it's reminiscent, they, they tell a story about um, a uh, rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, and uh, the shul had a changing membership and uh, at some point they wanted to vote to get rid of the mechitza and put in microphones and other, other types of things. So, uh, basically, uh, the vote was a very, very close vote. It was eight to change and seven to remain halacha. So the rabbi gave a very impassioned cry. He cried out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And he said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how will you, how will you allow the desecration of your holy base Knesset? How can this be? Do something, step in, stop. Don't allow the riches to happen. So a voice came from Shemayim that said, do not change anything. So the president of the show says, well, it's eight to eight. <laughs> you know, he says, that doesn't say that. <laughs> it, 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 it had been eight to seven, Hashem speaks, it's only eight to eight. Hashem's voice didn't count for very much. But, but you think this is such a chutzpah, but the Gemara goes on and records, the Gemara goes on and records that years later, in Amora met Eliyahu Hanavi and asked Eliyahu Hanavi, what was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's response when they told Hashem, stay out of this? The Gemara says, Hashem was laughing, and Hashem said, Nitzchuni Bonai, 
My children have been victorious over me. They are right. I will stay out of their dispute. Again, I'll come back and, and explain this. Uh, the Gemara then goes on. The rest of the story is not uh, so pleasant. Rabbi Eliezer still refused to change his position because after all, he had Hashem on his side. So Rabban Gamliel, the head of the Sanhedrin, excommunicated him. He put him in cherem for a refusal to accept the decision of a majority of the Sanhedrin. And uh, Rabbi Akiva was chosen. Rabbi Akiva was Rabbi Eliezer's disciple. He was chosen to give Rabbi Eliezer the news. And he goes into Rabbi Eliezer's room and Rabbi Eliezer is old and sick and in bed. And Rabbi Akiva doesn't say anything. But he stands more than four amos away, which is the distance you have to have when somebody is excommunicated. And Rabbi Eliezer initially did not grasp what was happening. And he said to Rabbi Akiva, what is the problem? Come, come close. And Rabbi Akiva said, it appears that your colleagues have separated themselves from you. And Rabbi Eliezer began to sob, he began to weep. And he said he is like a Sefer Torah that is locked up and tied up. That there's so much he could teach and there's so much he could accomplish. And now he will not be able to do so. What's interesting is Rabbi Eliezer's own wife was Rabbi Gamliel's sister. And it's recorded in the Gemara in Bava Metziah that she never let her husband say Tachanun. She, she always interrupted him when it was time to say Tachanun. Because Tachanun is the part of, of tefillah where you pour out your personal anguish to God. And she was afraid if Rabbi Eliezer were to express his pain, her brother would die. Hashem would, would avenge her brothers, uh, what her brother did to Rabbi Eliezer. So she always used to watch him when he dived into the Amida and she would kind of interrupt him before he said Tachanun. But on Rosh Chodesh she didn't have to supervise him. Because on Rosh Chodesh there's no Tachanun. But the Gemara says, one time she thought a day was Rosh Chodesh when it wasn't. So she wasn't watching him. And when she walked in, she saw him saying Tachanun. So she said to him, you have killed my brother. And that very moment, news was received that Rabbi Gamliel had died. Now, I think we have to understand, I don't, I don't think we should assume that Rabbi Eliezer was consciously praying for the death of Rabbi Gamliel. I, I don't think that would be the assumption here. But rather the concept is, and again this is actually a very interesting idea in, in ethics, and that is even justifiable actions when they cause pain certainly to great and righteous people have a certain negative consequence that comes back and bites you. Rabbi Gamliel's actions may very well have been legitimate. Rabbi Gamliel saw, remember this is the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. Rabbi Gamliel saw a need for unity, a need to accept halachic authority. If you allow Rabbi Eliezer to flaunt or flout the decision of the Sanhedrin, then, then many other people could do so as well or would not be qualified. And as you know from other stories, Rabbi Gamliel was, was very, very stark in preserving the authority of his office. In fact, he was even deposed uh, because of a later story uh, with Rabbi Yoshua. Then he, then he got reinstated. So Rabbi Gamliel was justifiable, was justified in what he did. Nevertheless, if that causes pain and suffering and humiliation and hurt, it comes back to bite you. In other words, the justification of your action does not immunize you necessarily from negative consequences. An example would be, if I walk by, if there's a fire, and God forbid there's a child that potentially could be burnt in that fire, and I dive into the fire and I rescue the child, I did a wonderful thing, I did a heroic thing, I did a tremendous thing. But the fact that I did a wonderful action does not mean I'm not going to be burnt. Most of the time I am going to be burnt. And that's, if that's true in the physical realm, it's also true in the spiritual realm. Actions that hurt people do have consequences. Okay, 
Now, let me just digress for a moment on the three miracles. You'll notice that before Rabbi Eliezer called upon the Baskol directly, the voice from heaven, Rabbi Eliezer did three miracles. The carob tree, the changing of the river channel, and the walls of the Beis HaMedrash. So there's a nice shot from the Vilna Gaon that these three incidents, these three miracles, are symbolic of the qualities one needs to be a great Talmud Chacham and scholar of Torah. Meaning he's trying to show that Hashem has validated me. It's like an in, it's like an in personam validation. He couldn't prove his point logically in the way that they accepted it, but he's trying to prove his point by bolstering his credentials and by saying that God approves of my credentials. And the Vilna Gaon's list of the three qualities that a person needs to be great in Torah is number one, to be satisfied with very little, meaning not to be an overly materialistic or hedonistic person. If a person is too involved in the gashmiut and the materialism and the pleasures of this world, his mind and heart will not be focused on the Torah. So Rabbi Eliezer wants to show he is a mistapek b'muat. Now the proof of that would be the carob tree. We know that when Chazal want to describe a person who lives a very simple life, a life which is not connected to luxuries. It talks about Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, for example, who is a great miracle worker. It discusses that he would only eat a kav, a small measure of charuvim, of kerub, me'er of Shabbos, the of Shabbos, in a whole week. So Rabbi Eliezer is saying the kerub tree can testify that I am a mistapek b'muat. Now, the second quality a person needs for greatness in Torah is humility. Now, we know Torah is compared to water, and there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is, just as water moves from high ground to low ground, the Torah leaves the arrogant and stays with the humble. So Rabbi Eliezer is saying, I am modest, I am humble, and the water will testify to my humility. Now, here, you might say, well, that's a little strange. I am so humble that I'm, causing a, I'm calling upon a supernatural miracle to affirm how humble I am. I mean, one might argue that itself is an act of pride and arrogance. But not really, not really. Because if a person genuinely is acting for the sake of God, I mean, for most of us, if I would get up and say, I am such a humble person, You've never seen someone as humble as me. That would strike us as gaiva, right? That would strike us as arrogance. But if a person is truly and sincerely acting for the sake of heaven, he's basically saying, it's not my ego, it's not about me, it's not about I need to be right. It's my genuine attempt to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I could, be, I could prove this to you. Because the water itself, which is the symbol of humility, will validate what I am. And the third quality that a Talmud Chacham needs is simply putting in the time of learning. You can be the most righteous person if you don't put in the time and the effort in learning Torah, you will not be Matzliach. And that is symbolized by the walls of the Beit HaMidrash that could testify he was always the first to enter and the last to leave. And therefore these three miracles are an attempt to bolster his credibility as a great scholar of Torah. The carob tree is mistapek b'muat. The water is anava. And uh, the kotlei beis medrash is hatzmadar shkeda, diligence in the learning of Torah. Okay, but that didn't work. And he calls upon the bat kol. And the chachamim's response to the bat kol is lo b'shamayimi. So here, let's ponder for a moment this very, very, almost outrageous concept that the Torah is not in heaven. When we study and we try to figure out what halacha is, given the fact that we don't have direct channels of prophecy, we have to do it by inference. So we use logic, we use precedent, uh, we look at different texts, we try to put things together. But ultimately, although we're using human reasoning, the ultimate question we're trying to answer is, what does the Almighty want me to do in a given situation? Now granted, we're not going to get 
a direct answer from God, but that's what we're trying to do. So if Hashem short circuits the process and tells you what he wants, we say back then what you want is irrelevant. It's not Nogea what we're trying to do. That's the very thing we're trying to do. What is the Ratzon Hashem? If you're trying to figure out the Ratzon Hashem and Hashem tells you his Ratzon, Loba Shemayim, he says, your Ratzon is not relevant. Imagine, to give you a trivial example, children are deciding what they would like to get a parent for a birthday gift. Right? You say what you want to get your father for a birthday gift. So some say, well, Abba likes a tie, Abba likes a watch, Abba likes a safer, uh, whatever it would be. And all the kids are talking. And Abba or Ima, whoever it is, walks by and overhears the conversation and says, well, you know, you don't have to give me a gift, but if you're talking about a gift, this is what I really like. So the kids say to Abba, you know, please stay out of this. You know, assume, you, know uh, you have no part in this discussion. We are discussing what you would like for your birthday, so please don't interrupt. <laughs> He's telling us what he wants. Loba Shemayimi. It makes no sense at all. That is what halacha is supposed to be, theoretically. So, we have a commentary from the Ran, Rabbeinu Nisim, in the Drusha Saran, that says a very, very fascinating idea. We have a related question. Throughout Shas, you have many, many arguments between great rabbis, and even after, after the Gemara as well. And these arguments are sometimes taking mutually exclusive and contradictory positions. One says mutar, one says oser, one says kosher, one says treif, one says tame, one says tohar, one says chayev, you have to pay, the other says pater. Which is right? So the Gemara has an enigmatic statement these and those are both right. Eilu vi Eilu. Divrei Elokim Chayim. They're both right. The one that says kosher is right and the one that says treif is right. Granted, we have to have some decision as to what we do. But in terms of the theoretical concept of MS, they're both correct. It's reminiscent of the old story about a rabbi in which uh, two litigants appeared. They had a Din Torah. And one person stated his case, and the rabbi said, you're right. And the other person said his case, and the rabbi said, you're right. And the rabbi said, how can they both be right? He says, you're right also. Everybody's right. So, number one, so these are two questions, but you'll see they're going to be related. One is, by what logic do we reject Hashem's input in the halachic process through a principle called Loba Shomayim He, if halacha is about Ratzon Hashem? And the second question is, on the concept of Eilu V'Eilu, until you have a vote of the Sanhedrin, Eilu V'Eilu Divreilu Kim Chayim, how can two contradictory positions be correct? So the Drasha Saran answers both questions with this idea. He differentiates between what he terms mathematical truth and what he terms halachic truth. <coughs> mathematical truth, again, at least in simple mathematics, let's say arithmetic. I know there are higher mathematics where there is an indeterminacy, but in standard arithmetic, there is only one correct answer. Uh, if you have a different answer than the correct one, it's not a matter of opinion, it's not a matter of pluralistic understandings of things, it is simply a matter of right versus wrong. One plus one is two. You say three, you say four, you say five and a half, you are incorrect. Like the old expression, everybody is entitled to their opinion, but uh, not everybody is entitled to their facts. Although in the United States, uh, uh, Trump's uh, counselor Kellyanne Conway did introduce the idea of alternative facts, but <laughs> Baderach Cloud, we would not accept the notion of alternative realities. Who uh, Kellyanne Conway. Uh, she's a very close guy. Actually, she, she's one of the people who really got Trump elected. She's extremely uh, competent and capable political operative. I don't want to digress too much. Uh, her husband hates Trump, so it's a bit, you know, I, I, they, have, they must have, I mean, I hope their Shalom bias is okay, because uh, <laughs> she is his big defender day after day, and he is mamish, uh, calling for his impeachment publicly day after day, so I don't know exactly how they get, uh, how they get together on weekends or whatever, but, uh, but hopefully the marriage will, will survive. Uh, but uh, in, any, in any event, mathematical truth 
has one fixed point. Halachic truth, says the Ran, is a very different type of process. <coughs> Hashem gave the Jewish people principles and foundational ideas. The 13 methods of interpretation, the basic principles. But he then left it to the Chachamim of every generation to take those principles and apply them to the new situations that constantly emerge. Torah is eternal, but life is ever-changing. So, when we have things like, whether it's electricity, microwave, surrogate motherhood, atomic energy, cloning, and we're trying to figure out the Ratzon Hashem, we're not really asking, what did God tell Moshe on Mount Sinai about cloning? Because the short answer is, God said nothing to Moshe Rabbeinu about cloning, but God gave Moshe Rabbeinu principles from which the sages in every generation will be able to apply those principles to come to some halachic ruling. But given the fact, therefore, that the specific application of halacha to new situations is not something that was directly communicated to Moshe. It is simply the utilization of principles. Then in effect what God is saying is, assuming you're an authorized person, now that's, that's, I'm, I'm skirting over that question, but assuming you are a person that is capable and competent to make those determinations, even if you get your answer wrong, i.e. it's not the answer that God would have come to, God blesses your answer with the imprimatur of truth because you have utilized his principles and his process. It's like getting full credit for process. Sometimes a person may have a complicated problem and actually come up with the wrong answer. But the process was elegant and logical and correct. And Hashem says, as long as the process is followed, by the people who are authorized and competent to engage in that process, that becomes the divine will, even if in a sense it is wrong. If you remember, the Mishnah Rosh Hashanah gives an example of the Sanhedrin proclaiming the wrong day Rosh Hashanah, astronomically the wrong day, and that would mean Yom Kippur would be the wrong day. And Rabbi Gamliel, again, as a, a Nasi who was very determined, ordered someone to come on the day that was astronomically Yom Kippur. And Rabbi Akiva told the rabbi, don't worry about it. This day is no longer Yom Kippur if the sages ruled the other day was Yom Kippur. So the Ran says the nature of halachic process is that even when a decision may be objectively incorrect. It is blessed with the imprimatur of MS as long as, again, this as long as is a major, major issue, the people are ra'oi and worthy of making halakhic determinations. They are acting l'shem shamayim. They are acting uh, without an agenda. Again, these are difficult questions. And therefore, even when HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to the Chachamim, Rabbi Eliezer is objectively correct. If the Chachamim say, our logic and our understanding of the Torah leads us to a different conclusion, Hashem says, if that's how you see it, that is how I see it. I am a vatel my objective opinion to your hachra'ah. Now the question is, why should that be so? Why should that be so? Why don't you simply say, if they get it wrong, they get it wrong. Why, does, why did Hashem create the Torah? That's kind of a crazy way to give it to her. First of all, you understand that that's a source of infinite machlokas. Instead of Hashem giving an, Hashem could have given answers to every question. Instead of saying, I'm going to give you some general rules and I'm leaving it to you to figure it out. And sometimes you'll get it right, and sometimes you'll get it wrong. And even if you get it wrong, it's okay with me. Why couldn't Hashem just give us the rules? Well, one answer might be, Hashem couldn't possibly give us all the rules. 
because that would be too many things. <laughs> what, every shayla? That would be billions and trillions. In order to allow the oral law to respond to all of the developments in life, there had to be an open-ended quality to it. But another answer might be, consider this muscle. Let's imagine you wanted to make a cake for your child. Your child is in gun. So the easiest way of making a cake is when your child is either in school, in gun, or asleep. You make the cake, or you even buy the cake. Very, very easy. But a deeper level of relationship is not to simply give her a birthday cake, but to make the cake together. Now to make the cake together with a four-year-old is not an easy thing. There's a lot of frustration there. Uh, there could be cocoa on the floor and there could be sugar poured on the counter and there could be an eggshell you know, in the batter and it could be uneven and lumpy and underbaked at one end and uh, overbaked in the other end. If the only concern was the quality of the final product, you could do a lot better uh, without, uh, without the kid. But the love is in the sharing and in the relationship. HaKadosh Baruch Hu could have given us a Torah where he simply gave us all the rules. But instead HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I want to create a Torah where you and I are partners and co-creators. And even when you make a mistake, I will validate your mistake. Now, people do ask Akasha because there is in the Torah itself a mechanism for the Sanhedrin to correct mistakes that it's made. If you remember in Parshas Vayikra, there is actually a korban that the Sanhedrin brings when they have determined they have made an erroneous ruling that has affected the Jewish people. Par Helam Davar. Uh, so how could that be? If, if whatever decision they make is, by definition, validated by God, how could there be a concept of mistake? But, but, the, but I think the answer to that is, the mistake itself is part of the halachic process, meaning to say, it's the Sanhedrin that has to decide, based on their understanding of the Torah, that they made a mistake. It's not Hashem. If Hashem were to tell them they made a mistake, that would be Loba Shamayami, and there would not be a par helim davar. So, did you want to say in the back? Oh, yeah. yeah um, so it's the wrong thing, Edu to Edu, um, specifically in the case where um, new, shyness, new questions come up because of the time. What about when the Chacham was discussing, I, I really are discussing something that Moshe, the Hashem told Moshe at that time. Yeah, yeah, so, so well, well, Okay, or another example, maybe you mean this as well, is sometimes you have a machlokas about a historical event. Did this happen? Did this not happen? Now there, that's very difficult to say both opinions are true because that deals with a past event which either happened or did not happen. So indeed, there are some authorities that say, some Rishonim that say, it's not Shaykh Eilu vi Eilu on anything that's in the past, and therefore one opinion is right and one opinion is wrong. Others say the Maral is an approach that mo many of these Machloksim are in the realm of Agada, and there may be symbolic meanings to things. So, so even if on a literal sense, it's impossible for both to be right, but there will be some symbolic concept which will salvage it, so to speak, and give it the nitzutz, give it the spark of being MS. But, that, but that, that is a good question. But certainly, when you're dealing with any type of modern situation, if you have a machlokas, whether it's mutter to have a heart transplant or, or, or not mutter to have a heart transplant, so even though any given person will follow the halacha that, of their posek, but in terms of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, both are emes because both are considered to be legitimate exercises of the halachic process. And in the absence of a Sanhedrin, those other opinions are not refuted. Now, if you had a Sanhedrin, then you would apply the rule that that's the final decision because that is Hashem's definition of what is halacha. But Bisman HaZeh, we really don't have a mechanism 
for a final halacha. If it's a machlokas haposkim, it's a machlokas haposkim. Uh, you can't really say one is right and one is wrong. Now, this is why Rav Yitzhak writes, Matan Torah is described as Matan Torah. Matan. Matan Torah means giving of the Torah. It actually means giving away the Torah. Loba Shamayim He is HaKadosh Baruch Hu abdicated his unilateral control over the halachic process by making us partners. That's a tremendous thing. We become partners. In fact, that's a metaphor for life generally. The whole concept of Adam HaRishon is that the world was left in a state of incompletion. And we become God's partners. How in dri- the word matan? Huh? How do you see that from the word matan? Because matan can refer to giving a matana. Now, if Matan Torah is simply God commanding, we wouldn't call that Matan, we would call it Sivoy Torah. Matan Torah is He gave it to us. We get ownership of it. We have ownership, it's ours. Uh, you know, man was charged with draining the swamps, uh, with, with conquering disease. In other words, yes, everything comes from Hashem, but we have to be active partners. So the Chiddush is, that's even more true in the spiritual realm. Hashem made us the co-creators of the application of Torah in the world that we live in. That's Matan Torah. And indeed, the Gemara and Brachas, you see this Beferish, there's a Pasuk in Mishle that we recite every time we put back the Sefer Torah. Ki lekach tov nosati lachem torasi al tazovo. I have given you lekach, I have given you a good purchase. Do not forsake it. The Gemara says, Hashem's Mida is not like a Basar Vidam. When a Basar Vidam sells a very precious object, the Mocher is unhappy. He had to part with it. The buyer is happy. But Hashem sold us the Torah and he still rejoices. Now the analogy is, what do you mean sold us the Torah? I mean, Hashem commanded us. The answer is, once again, He sold it. He basically gave it away. Loma Shemayimi. So now it turns out, if you understand, now let's go all the way back to the Magen Avram's question. Shavuos is the wrong date. So now, let, let's look at it this way. If you understand that Matan Torah is not simply about Hashem giving us commandments, but Hashem making us His partner, in the creation of truth. And that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will accept our work and our effort and our toil. And that will become his Ratzon. When is the first time that that happens? It happened on Friday, the 6th of Sivan, the 50th day of the Omer, when it was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's desire to give the Torah that day. But because of Moshe Rabbeinu's interpretation, and if you look at the Gemara, you'll actually see that Moshe Rabbeinu actually misunderstood God's command. He didn't deliberately change it. He misunderstood God's command and thought you needed an extra day. He was wrong. But what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu say? If that's how you understand my will, then that becomes my will. That is the greatest Matan Torah there could be. Matan Torah occurred not by an act of commission, but by an omission in deference to the halachic misunderstanding of Moshe Rabbeinu himself. And that is why on the 6th of Sivan, which that year was a Friday, on the 50th day of the Omer, when Hashem intended to give the Torah, but did not because Moshe Rabbeinu understood that an extra day was necessary, that is the day of Matan Torah. So it's still true if we ask the question, what happens on Shavuos? The answer is nothing. But in that nothingness was the greatest giving of the Torah that would be possible. 
right? So that's uh, quite an amazing idea. Now, as I say, these are dangerous ideas, so to speak. In fact, Elohim, Yerilokim, Chayim can be misunderstood. People can use it as justification for all types of reforms and all types of deviations. And that's why we really need to be very, very careful as to when it is applied, how is it applied, who is authorized to make these determinations. But nevertheless, the concept is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants Klal Yisrael to be the co-creators of Torah. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes you hear people, and in my own yeshiva, uh, you know, where, where, where the idea is stressed over and over again that the oral law was given directly from Hashem to Moshe and then passed down generation to generation. So sometimes, even Rebbeim, but, but often uh, students, have this idea that every word in the Gemara, every word in the Gemara was given to Moshe at Mount Sinai and it was handed down for hundreds and hundreds of years till Ravashi wrote it down because it was in danger of being forgotten. Now, if you think about this, look at a page of Talmud and you can see how fundamentally absurd that idea is. The Gemara has discussions. Abaye says something to Rava. Now, if you're telling me this was given to Moshe at Sinai, is Abaya reading a script? Like somebody gives Abaya uh, a letter that says, Abaya, we have a tradition thousands of years old that on Monday morning today, you are to say these words. And then Rava is told what he should say. Obviously, that's not what's going on. What's going on is the Amoraim are debating. They are using their minds. They're doing the same thing. Um, of course, they're infinitely greater than us, of course. But they're doing the same thing we do. When we sit and we learn and we discuss, nobody is telling us ahead of time what we're supposed to say. And nobody told them ahead of time what they were supposed to say. They were using their minds. Uh, they are debating. They are discussing. It is a human effort grounded in reasoning, albeit by extremely great and holy people. No, no question about that. So, in what way do you call that divine? Why is that divine? It's not from God. It's people debating and discussing. The answer is, it's divine in the sense that because it is based on principles that Hashem gave Moshe. And part of those principles is Hashem then delegated to the sages to apply those principles to the vicissitudes and the ever-changing questions of life, it is divine because that is the process that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said shall be used. So it is godly, but it's not godly in the sense that Hashem gave the exact words that are to be said. I mean, there's no question. In fact, a lot of people misunderstand a lot of things. Even the idea of the written Torah, which clearly was dictated by God. But we say, Hashem gave Moshe the Torah at Mount Sinai. Well, consider this. A lot of things at Mount Sinai, a lot of things in the Torah happened after Mount Sinai. We have the story of the spies, the story of Korach. Uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Mount Sinai, does he tell the Jewish people about the spies, about Korach? By the way, in around a year, there's going to be a real bad thing that's going to happen, but we've got we to gotta do it this way. Uh, Korach, uh, just be sure you're standing in the right spot. Yeah, you know, obviously, Things happened when they happened. Yeah, God eventually dictated it to Moshe, what to write down. But that's not what Moshe got at Sinai. At Sinai, maybe he got the mitzvot. The narration of the Torah is a historical narrative that spanned uh, 40 years, you know, before Mitzrayim, and then 40 years in the desert. In fact, the Ramban writes, very simple, that the Torah was not written down till the very end of Moshe's life. So Moshe did not come down from Mount Sinai with a Sefer Torah. He came down with the Ten Commandments. The Sefer Torah was written either as events happened or it was written in one fell swoop at the end of the 40 years. And there's a whole Machlokas who wrote the last eight verses which talks about Moshe Rabbeinu's death. So one point that a person needs to pay very careful attention to is that when Chazal used the word Torah Moshe received the Torah at Sinai. T 
Torah means different things in different contexts. Sometimes it refers to the five books of Moses, and sometimes it refers to mitzvot and not historical narration, and sometimes it refers to the totality of halacha, both the written and the oral Torah. It is not Torah. The word Torah is not used in a uniform way. And every time it's used, one needs to understand what the text is. The one thing we can say very clearly is that Moshe Kibel Torah Misenai does not mean the whole Sefer Torah. The stuff that happened after Matan Torah was not recorded until after Matan Torah. Otherwise, you get into the craziness of the spies knowing ahead of time what they're supposed to do. And clearly, people were not actors in a, in a play. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Would this mean that I would ask the rod, what about using a telephone on on Shabbos? And the rod would answer as he very likely would. This is the right one. Yeah. That would be a not be a totally honest answer. A totally honest answer would be, well, I don't know, but the majority of authorities claim believe that it's the right. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. You know, again, a Rav may have reasons why he doesn't want to give you the minority opinion, but okay, but, but that would be correct. Um, again, the point I want to make is that anything that's a new question, we're not saying, what did Hashem say to Moshe? That's not, that's not right. The question is, how do we apply the principles that Hashem said to Moshe in applying it to new situations? And that's why there could be a machlokas. Otherwise, people ask the question, isn't machlokas inconsistent with revelation? Because if Hashem gave the answer, then how could there be machlokas unless somebody has it wrong? But the answer is, machlokas is not inconsistent with revelation, because revelation refers to fundamental principles, and machlokas will be in applying the fundamental principles to new situations. And as the Rambam writes, it's entirely possible for two sages who have identical first principles to differ as to the application of those principles <laughs> in new situations. And that is not a contradiction to a commonality of first principles. And the Torah Shavu'al Peh are like the first principles which are the bedrock foundations of the halachic uh, process. Yeah. For us to be involved in Torah, so even if it's a little messy, at least we have a relationship with Hashem in a way. Do we, does that apply to today? Do we, it doesn't feel like we have the ability to engage in Torah in Yeah, so, so it's a good question. It does apply today, but it may not apply today in the same way, meaning to say the full fledged application of I determine what halacha is, that may be something that most of us are not able to, to do. We need to have poskim and gedolim. But, at least to a lesser degree, we still have that engagement. You know, uh, sometimes you sometimes find even in yeshiva, certainly in chadarim, that if somebody uh, is learning chumash and they come up with an insight, so the rabbi might ask them, what's your source? And if you can't come up with the source, you know, then it's, it's no good. So I would suggest that maybe that's not a totally valid approach. Hashem wants us to also bring our creativity, our insight, our grappling with the text, our thoughts to matters. These are valuable. And in that sense, we, on, uh, even on our level where, where it may not go to ultimate halachic decision making, but we are invited to bring ourselves into the process and to explore the Torah as we could understand it. Now you have to have a lot of humility, you have to have deference to the greatness of people that both came before you and that exist in your generation. But within that deference and respect, your individual insight is welcomed. Uh, Rav Soloveitchik used to speak very, very beautifully, Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, about, uh, you know, he talked a lot about loneliness you know, when he lost his wife and, and lost his father, the father and mother. You know, he talked about the loneliness and the void and the emptiness that he felt in his life. But he said his great comfort was when he pulled out a Gemara, he felt immediately he was in a room full of people and he was engaged with them. There was Hillel and Shammai and there was Rashi and Tosos Rabbeinu Tam and the Rambam and there was his father and his grandfather uh, that were there. 
uh, and he felt he was engaged in a discussion with them, in an interaction with them, in which he would contribute his thoughts uh, to their thoughts to try to work things out. And he says that was a cure. He felt Limud HaTorah in that way, and it spans centuries and it spans different countries, right? And he said that was the antidote to his loneliness to be connected to all of the discussions. That's why when we learn, you know, we always use the present tense. We say, Hillel says, Rashi says, Rambam says. It's as if, literally, you are with them and you're discussing things. Certainly with Rashi, I, I, in fact, I'm giving Rabbi Weinshul, I'm giving a, a short series on Rashi. But anyone that learns Rashi, I think develops a great personal affection for Rashi. Because you get a sense how much Rashi cares about you, that he's holding your hands and he's trying to explain and lead you through things. And you read a Gemara and it just doesn't make sense and you look in Rashi and Rashi's, oh, the connection is this, etc. Uh, so there is a real, real sense that we are connected with all of this, our past and, and all the different countries, all the different centuries. And in that way, Hashem welcomes your chidushim and your contributions and your insights and your thoughts. And that is an important aspect, even today, I think. Okay, anyway, I wish you all... Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So, if I understood, you said that, that uh, we need to learn halacha to understand what Hashem wants from us? Well, well uh, halacha is one of the things. Uh, it's not the only thing, but halacha is expressing how Hashem wants you to live your life in a practical way. Uh, Judaism is not only about theory. Judaism is about action. And halacha defines the actions. But it's not the only thing, because Judaism is also about belief, and it's also about emotion, and it's also about uh, different thoughts. So. I, I, don't, I don't mean to say halacha is the only avenue, but it is a very important avenue in one way or the other because Judaism is action-oriented and halacha is action. Anyway, I, I wish you all a Chag Sameach and may all of us merit to accept the Torah with <coughs> unity and, and with joy.